maybe most famous in EOC circles because he and Gene Buckeye put together a, a great book about EOC companies here in the United States. You might be familiar with it. If you're not, you should pick one up. They're out on the book, book counter, so you should grab one of those. And uh, so I have known John, actually, I'll, I'll, then I'll introduce the last John too. Um, John McNerney uh, is at Catholic University of America, and he's also a, a priest from Ireland. And uh, I first met John and John when I went to a Philippines conference, and uh, John introduced me to John, and uh, that's when I first was introduced to the EOC. And then John Gallagher asked me to come to an EOC meeting in D.C., uh, a rental business for quite a while where we have the homeless help us with things and we help them and they help us. And so it's a very integrated model of something that I guess is very EOC-like. And so we first were doing that and then we found the EOC and found that these seem to be our people. And so we've, we've joined uh, with uh, Being academics, uh, we have maybe a special opportunity to evangelize in a unique world, and that's the world of academia. And so we've been trying to do that. One of the things we did, and you have it up here, is at Crate Time, a Business, Faith, and Confidence <coughs> Institute. And we put on a symposium every fall, and in 2018 I was on sabbatical, so I decided I'd do whatever I want. And I brought in some friends of mine that work especially on Catholic social thought, to have them sort of try to integrate Catholic social thought with EOC. And um, that was our goal for the conference. We had a variety of people, some of whom were already quite familiar with EOC, like John, uh, John uh, McNerney knew some about it. John Gallagher wasn't at the conference, but he published a paper in our journal that's coming out. That journal uh, will be published probably in March, and it's going to be open access, it's available to everyone. So all the articles that happen in this conference, plus John's, will be in that. And the Pope's uh, speech to EOC will also be published now. We got permission from the Vatican. And also uh, uh, one of the key talks of uh, CARE movement. Uh, so those will all be in this journal together to allow professors to disseminate it to their students and assign it. It'll be free to everyone because it's an open access journal out of Creighton from the theology department. So I'm going to actually pass around sign-up sheets. If you're interested, when it comes out, I can let you know and send you the link. Uh, so we'll send that up around here in just a moment. Um, so the, the goal has been to try to, through this conference, is to think about how Catholic social thought integrates with POC. We hope that we can help more and more academics to bring that to their students, and then we can have a wider impact in that. So we've got special access sort of to that area. Uh, I feel like I've been evangelized to the EOC mostly through the stories of people like John and Paul and others like you, and Nick, and the stories that I've heard. That's what really drew me to it. But for academics, sometimes you need to think, what are the thoughts here that really draw us in? And so we're trying to do that each in our own way. And so we're each going to share a bit from what our papers were on um, for that conference, and hopefully that will help you see sort of what academics are trying to do to bring an EOC into the marketplace of ideas more than uh, With that, I think we'll start with uh, good morning. It's really nice to be here and to be with you, and um, it's a privilege to be able to speak a little bit about what I've been thinking about in um, on economy of communion. My interest recently has been to try to articulate what makes the economy of communion way of doing business distinctive. And my goal, my hope, would that be that I could write something that faculty would feel comfortable assigning in their business classes. I teach business ethics and we always read um, essays about the purpose of the firm. We read these very canonical essays from business ethics about what is the purpose of the firm. And I think that so this question arises, well, is EOC doing what other businesses are doing, or are they doing it just in a different way, or do they just have different motives, or is it really genuinely distinctive and alternative? And I think it is. I think the EOC way of doing business is genuinely distinctive, and it can't be um, reduced to kind of dominant ways of thinking about business and its purpose. So but, um, in my paper, I try to contrast you know, it's useful exercise to do comparison and contrast. What does it share in common? What's different? And so I'm just going to describe very, very briefly kind of the, some of the movements or theories that I think can contrast with EOC. So uh, the dominant theories of the purpose of business um, can be expressed as stakeholder theory and stockholder theory. Stockholder theory says that the purpose of business is to create value for owners, stockholders. Um, and businesses create value for stockholders by 
generating profit or possibly maximizing profit. Um, and that's what's been that's their social responsibility to return that to owners. So then in management theory, there's a question, of course, of how do we do this and what's the best way to do this, but that's the purpose of the firm, to generate or maximize profit. Stakeholder theory, by contrast, says that um, the purpose of the firm is broader than just generating value for stockholders. It's to generate value or maximize value for stakeholders. And stakeholder, a stakeholder is anybody who has a stake in the success of the firm. So obviously that is the stockholders, the owners, um, but it's also the employees, they have a stake in the business, and the customers, suppliers, if the company goes belly up, it's not good for them, uh, the community, uh, the financiers. So there's a, there's a broader swath of people who can be affected by the success of the firm, and managers need to manage for all of these stakeholders. There's two ways of approaching stakeholder thinking, and it's, um, one is a kind of instrumental, it'll be more profitable if you take care of your stakeholders. And then there's a kind of non-instrumental way of thinking about stakeholder theory, which is you, you should have concern, moral, there's their moral, moral responsibility on the part of business to have, to have an, ex, an intrinsic concern for the interests of all of these people who you are capable of affecting. So those are the dominant ways of thinking about um, the purpose of the firm. I don't think that the EOC way of doing business is adequately captured by either of those dominant ways of thinking about the purpose of business. Instead, I'm proposing that the EOC offers us a person-centered theory of the firm. And this person-centered theory of the firm is genuinely um, different than either of those two. I'll just describe one way in which I think it's different, because I want to contrast it with a few other things, and I only have probably three minutes left or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, so this, this person-centered theory of the firm, I think one of the major things that makes the EOC way of business doing different is that both stakeholder and stockholder theory say that the purpose of the firm, firm is ultimately to generate or maximize profit. Why do we want profit? Don't ask that question. <laughs> That's not a question that they think they can answer. The purpose of profits is whatever those owners of the profits want to do with them. There's, they don't. They do not ask what is the purpose of profit. And if you don't ask what the purpose of profit is, you're in a situation where the profit is the kind of good where more is always better. That's intrinsic to its nature as a good. Um, and if, if you don't ask the question what is the purpose of profit, then more is always better. And then you're running your business and you're locked in a rat race. Or no matter how much profit you generate, you could always generate more, and that would be better. And so you could always do business better by generating more. Right? So the EOC does ask, what is the purpose of profit? And it situates its account of the, the role and purpose of business within a wider theory of life about what is the appropriate role and purpose of profit. And I think doing that then shapes and restructures all kinds of things within the operation of the firm. And for EOC businesses, what, what becomes central is not only that profits are generated, because they are for-profit firms, okay, um, but how profits are generated. And that is equally central in the EOC way of thinking and, and doing business. Um, so that's what I'm going to say about that part. I also compare and contrast the EOC way of doing business with other new initiatives in the business world. There are lots of people who are very interested in uh, coming up with new models for how to do business. Um, for example, uh, there's, there's, there are lots of movements in social enterprise, or sometimes it's called social entrepreneurship. So is EOC a version of social entrepreneurship? Um, there are, um, within, within the business world, of course, there are long-standing practices of what's known as corporate social responsibility. So is EOC basically a way of entrepreneurs and business people enacting corporate social responsibility in their business practice? Um, and then uh, the final question is, well, what about a B Corps? There are these new things called B Corps, and could EOC businesses basically be another kind of B Corp? So I'll say just a little bit about these three, and then I'm going to hand the mic off to somebody else. Uh, one, I think the EOC, 
I, and I, I think I've heard EOC entrepreneurs use the language of corporate social responsibility, and I can see why. Because it's a, a well-known language, it's well embedded into business vocabulary, and um, it's easy to communicate. Also, a lot of things that EOC entrepreneurs do look very similar to corporate social responsibility. Uh, there's lots of ways in which that can manifest itself. Um, organizing employees for uh, volunteer days, for example. Uh, philanthropy. Corporate philanthropy is an expression of corporate social responsibility. Um, adopting a school and doing something special for a school, something like that. And EOC businesses often do those kinds of things, which are in the regular business world manifestations of corporate social responsibility. But I don't think that that's all EOC is doing, in part because in the business world, corporate social responsibility exists within um, that stakeholder stockholder paradigm, both of which presume that the end of business is profit. And wherever you find corporate social responsibility initiatives, you find a very constant and persistent pressure to justify these initiatives because they are conceptualized as going beyond the domain specific to business. But the business activities are the ones which generate profit, corporate social responsibility activities are the ones that do not. So they're conceived as extrinsic to the goal and purpose of business. They're a tack on, they're an add-on. And I think when EOC businesses engage in those exact same activities, they do not see them as an add-on. They're conceptualized quite differently, actually. Um, social enterprise or social entrepreneurship don't even ask me what those terms mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let me, uh, broad generalization. As a broad generalization, I think that EOC can in some ways be conceived as um, the inverse of social enterprise. Social enterprises are very often organized this way. They're nonprofits. They, they're actually maybe even standard charities. They just give themselves this new trendy name. We're social entrepreneurs, you know. And uh, they have a, like a three-legged financial stool: traditional routes of charity grants, and this new leg of maybe a for-profit business that then supports the mission of the nonprofit. Um, and so they use, and, and these social entrepreneurs will very often use the more rigorous accounting methods of business to kind of measure the success. And, um, of their uh, of, of their organization, so they're they're very typically organized as nonprofits that own um, a for-profit business, whereas EOC, as a generalization, it's not always true, tends to be for-profit businesses that might own or donate their <laughs> profits to a nonprofit. So it's a kind of it's a kind of inverse model. Um, also, I think one thing that characterizes a lot of the social entrepreneurship movement is an insistence that <coughs> social entrepreneurs are interested in large-scale impact. <coughs> and um, EOC, I think, is very comfortable that the, the, the change can be driven through the mustard seed. They don't insist on wide-scale impact. And these are businesses that don't have to transform the world. They can do the mundane productive activities that we need done in society and do them well into the glory of God just by doing what a business does. Uh, finally, the last one, um, B Corp certification. Um, wonderful movement. Uh, their motto is business is a force for good. Some of the B Corps that you, businesses that have sought B Corp certification include Patagonia, Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, um, Stony Brook, Stony Field Farms yogurt, you might know that. And these are all businesses doing um, great things, producing great products and services, and doing so in, um, in ways that benefit the world. Um, but I think EOC can be distinguished from some of those organizations in that generally EOC organizations do not aim simply to be uh, an, an organization. They're not seeking to organize themselves simply to produce a product or a service. They see the business as a, as a social sphere, a sphere in which communion between persons happens. Um, and so they see the good of business as not simply the production of a, a good or service, which is of course valuable, um, but also as a sphere within itself for communion between people. Okay. Thank you very much.
time for question and answer at the end. Good morning, everyone. I'm a priest philosopher from the island of Ireland that's near Iceland, approximately, with territorial claims over Greenland. <laughs> As you know, uh, I work in the business school, Catholic University of America. I'm delighted that the Dean, Andrew Vela, is here. It shows the horizons that uh, we seek to uh, expand in Washington as well. I have a page of a reflection, which I'll just uh, share with you as a meditation or a reflection. Um, the title of our uh, conference here, Reflections on an economy that works for all. That's an interesting title. An economy that works for all. What does for all actually mean? What does it entail? I think we can ask, can an economy actually work for everyone? I think it can. But St. Paul's admonishment to the first Christians at Thessalonica I think it's very insightful as well. And I quote, For we hear that some of you are walking in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Such persons we command to do their work in quietness and to earn their own living. <clears throat> End of quote. The original Greek here is very interesting. I won't bore you with it. But the Douay Reims uh, translation helps us understand a little bit what's going on. Those words, earn their own living, is translated as they would eat their own bread. In other words, their own bread that they may eat. On a Sunday drive, you might, for, an, in, for example, be very well attempted to stop at a roadside sign inviting you to buy mom's own homemade cook apple pie. This gets over the idea of what Paul is saying to the Christians at Thessalonica. At the idea, eat, estio in Greek, that they should eat their own bread even in an economic or business sense. In other words, what sustains us as human beings is what we make, what we create. So fundamental to an idea of an economy working at all is a distinctive Christian concept of work, which is indicated in living the reality of the eating of their own bread of the first Christians. Indeed, St. Paul II, in his reflections on the nature of labour, outlines how there is a transitive and intransitive uh, dimension of human action. A person's work obviously transforms material objects. That's the transitive nature, objectively. But it also involves a process that takes place within, huge, in, in, within each human individual in each human being, in each conscious subject. And that's the intransitive nature of what work can do. So, human labour is actually constitutive of who I am as a person. I can become who I am to work. What St. Paul says, uh, what St. Paul calls walking in idleness, or what we might call an unemployment has not just economic consequences, but it deconstructs who I am as a human person. And that's why it's a social evil. Carol Lubick's uh, Economy and Communion project, in my view, has a somewhat similar insight into the nature of business. There's an existential shift in her reflections about what the business of business is. She pushes us back to the hidden roots of a more personalistic understanding in philosophical and economic thought, which reaches back even to the scholastics. In Lubick's perspective, 
the human person is not only free from, but is free for, free for initiating a culture of love. And she sees this as fundamentally underlying economic relationships. And this is not so alien as it might seem within economic reflection. If, for example, if you take the British economist of the 19th century, Philip Wicksteed, he wrote the book, The Common Sense of Political Economy. He also got involved in the attempt to redirect the focal point of economic reflection away from material objects of the classical inquiry to the implications of individual choices and decisions. And his model for economic analysis was the mother, the mother of a family household. Now, I'm just near the conclusion. The Economy of Communion Project can likewise be understood as a way of recapturing the person-centric dimensions of economic action. I think it's usually significant that uh, Lubick, in the face of the great poverty she witnessed in Brazil in 1991, she turns not to solutions involving a redistribution of wealth, but to, to the prioritization of the creative and entrepreneurial dimensions of business life. The EOC can be understood in its fullness and intricacy only when considered from the, spiritual, uh, the spirituality's viewpoint of the human person and social relationships. Now, Carol Lubick, although not an expert in economics, she said, and I quote, she says, I thought that our people could set up firms and business enterprises so as to engage the, the capabilities and resources of all and to produce together. They would have to be managed, she says, by competent persons who would be capable of making them function efficiently and derive profits from them." End of quote. The American philosopher Michael Novak observed how we are indeed indebted to Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism for the insight into how cultural forces and the human spirit are essential to an understanding of an economy. But Novak argues that Weber's contribution constituted, he says, a near miss, because he seemed to view the economy in a purely mechanistic and calculative way. So, in other words, the missing link is human creativity and all that this entails, which is the heart of the free economic process. But Carol Lubick actually had this central insight in our launch of a new network of businesses operating according to this ethos. She recognised Peter Drucker's intuition that the ultimate resource in economic development is people, you and me. It is people, not capital or raw materials, that develop an economy. And Chiara Lubick's schools for entrepreneurs are, I think, like small oases where people can come together exercising judgment and making responsible decisions. I believe if we can unite these oases, it could be the case that the spiritual economic desert surrounding us disappears. Thank you very much. before that John McNerney also has a wonderful book called The Wealth of Persons. You know of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, and John's book is The Wealth of Persons, and he's working on another book too, so you really should read his book. <laughs> John. Thanks, Andy. So uh, let me start off by saying that I lost my notes for the talk that I wanted to give. <laughs> um, so they are on uh, two yellow line sheets of paper, so if you see them around, <laughs> um, you can give them back to me at any time. I'd be happy to give them back. Um, somewhere around eight, nine, uh, ten years ago, 
in the course of a number of conversations with a lot of EOC uh, business owners and entrepreneurs, um, Nick Sana made the comment that the economy of communion was prophetic. And um, that comment has just um, sort of stewed in the back of my mind ever since, um, trying to understand what that really means or think about what that means. And um, I happened to encounter, uh, just this past year, a work by uh, the Protestant theologian uh, Walter Brueggemann titled The Prophetic Imagination. And it helped me uh, to, to begin to make sense of Nick's uh, comments. So I just want to talk a little bit this morning about how and why I would now describe the EOC uh, with Nick as prophetic. Um, at the heart of uh, Brueggemann's idea of uh, the prophetic imagination uh, is his, his argument that a prophetic uh, ministry, if you will, or an exercise of prophetic imagination is really something that is um, counter to uh, the dominant um, culture, the dominant ideas in a particular society. And of course, he um, builds his argument from the um, scriptural basis of, of the prophets and, and the role of the prophets in the life of Israel. Um, but for me, uh, as I watched uh, young people go on strike this past year for global climate change and uh, reflect on the, um, the words of uh, Francis when he addressed the EOC in, in uh, Rome a couple of years ago. Uh, and Francis said that the, the principal ethical dilemma of capitalism is the creation of discarded persons. People that are marginalized um, in, in many ways in, in, in terms of economic and, and social life. Um, and it, you know, it struck me that that was really uh, one of the ways of understanding the global climate strikes. That certainly young people feel marginalized, uh, I think, in terms of the inability of the dominant culture, the dominant economic and political systems to address climate change in any meaningful way. So this, is, this was my frame of mind, um, trying again to understand uh, the economy of communion as an exercise of prophetic imagination. And uh, Brueggemann argues that there are three or four characteristics of a prophetic ministry or an exercise of prophetic uh, imagination. First of all, it certainly needs to be, uh, needs to articulate uh, an alternative consciousness to the dominant culture, the dominant political and economic uh, systems. Um, secondly, it functions as a criticism of the dominant culture and the dominant economic and political systems. But interestingly enough, it's not um, a normal sort of criticism, but it's really a criticism that expresses itself as grief, that is a grieving for the um, inadequacies and the um, exploitation that exists perhaps in the dominant, uh, again, the dominant sort of culture. So it's, it's a criticism that's really expressed more as a grieving for what could be as opposed to what is, if that makes any sense. And um, third, a third characteristic of a prophetic ministry is that it arises from within a particular culture or tradition. It's not something, it's organic, it's not something that is imposed um, in any way from an external agent or, or uh, an external circumstance. It's, it's, it grows up from within um, a, a, a tradition. 
And so when I think about the EOC in terms of those three characteristics, I think we can certainly say that the economy of communion is an alternative consciousness. If we think about what we've just heard from Celeste and from John about the people, the person-centeredness of the economy of communion, um, that certainly is an alternative consciousness. It's a different way of, of um, understanding um, what a person is, who a person is, but it also is, uh, in, in the economy of communion also conceives of, as Celeste pointed out, the purpose of the business. It's an alternative to the dominant idea about what a business is. Um, it's an alternative to um, the, 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 the importance of relationships in economic activity. It's an alternative in their understanding of profits. So there are a number of ways in which you can argue, I think, successfully, that the economy of communion is, does suggest uh, an alternative consciousness to the dominant culture. Secondly, I would argue that, um, and this is just based on my own experience of um, the economy of communion over a number of years, I do believe it to be an expression of grief. I think that it is really, um, there, there is certainly a joy associated with it, but I also think that there is a grieving for what could be. Uh, as opposed to what is. And I think um, there's a sensitivity uh, to that that I find um, uh, that permeates the economy of communion, at least in every way, shape, or form that I have encountered it. Um, and third, it's always been, well, I can't say always, but early on in my relationship with the EOC, it became pretty clear to me that the EOC, the economy of communion, certainly arises from uh, the culture of the focal art. There is no uh, doubt in my mind about that. Uh, so it, it arises from the spirituality of unity, uh, from the charism of unity, um, and is certainly an expression of that. So for those three uh, reasons, uh, you know, I, I argue that uh, and I agree with Nick, the economy of communion is indeed prophetic. It's a prophetic voice. It's standing in our culture saying, uh, no, there are some other considerations that uh, need to be part of our social and economic life. Um, I guess it's fair to say also, though, that Brueggemann argues that there's a fourth characteristic of prophetic ministries, exercises of prophetic imagination, and that is that they also must energize people to action. And um, I think this is where uh, certainly the economy of communion has been an energized action for 30 years now. Um, but that that Ener energizing to action is not something that's behind us. It is clearly in front of us. And so for the economy of communion to, to really be an exercise of prophetic imagination, it needs to continue to energize us to act uh, going forward. It's not about where we've been and what we've done. It's about where are we going, um, you know, where where. Where does this ministry take us? Um, so, that's the best I can remember from my notes. <laughs> stakeholder, stockholder theory, as Celeste talked about. Um, one of the things that I've sort of taken on is to try to read as many of the Italian economists who already have talked about EOC as I can. Because, for some reason, Americans don't read a lot of Italian economists. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm, I'm trying to bring that in, and I think that's one of our goals, it could be to, to get the wisdom from them and bring it into our discourse here. And so that's what I've been trying to do with some of the articles I've recently been working on. So I just want to share a couple of the insights that have been very exciting to me. Um, 
one of my, so there's Bruni, Zagmani, Crivelli, and you get Crivella, Crivella? Crivella? Yeah, he's in Swiss, Swiss, Switzerland, actually, but, uh, and I'm doing it. Um, so these are some that have really impacted me. Uh, you sometimes get academically, you, you have what you call academic crushes on certain people. Bruni is really good. Bruni is especially in Um So I uh, want to share a few of the things that have really made me excited. The Wound and the Blessing has been one of the most powerful books for me to read in recent years. Um, and Bruni, I think, sets up very well the EOC. There's two things I want to share. One is, he sets it up in terms of unfettered capitalism on the one hand, uh, where you have this freedom to do whatever you want to make as much profit as possible. And on the other hand, sort of anti-capitalist socialism. He brings up the French in particular. And he says these are both extremes, and the EOC is a civil e economics in between a civil economy. And it's because we do take from capital, we don't throw capitalism away. There, it's, it's private enterprise is what's helping drive this to solve social problems. So we're concerned about society and community as the socialists are but we're using private enterprise to solve that problem. And so that unity together of those two different strands that overcomes both of them, in my opinion, is what makes it so powerful what the EOC is about. It's private enterprise, it's economy of communion in freedom, right? Because we want people to have freedom. In all the papal encyclicals, which speak about, uh, uh, since 1800, when they talk about private property, they say, we must have private property. They're anti-communist, anti-Marxist in the sense of having communal, no one owns anything. So you have to have private property. And so private property is part of what gives us freedom, it's part of what gives us dignity. And so we want people to be able to have their own property and to have the dignity of that through the enterprise. So that's part of our goal. So that was one idea from the way that he uh, sets all that up is very powerful for me to think about conceptually. But also then just the concept of the wound and the blessing. And that so often in business, we set up, we have policies and procedures which we need, but we often use those to shield ourselves from dealing with persons. And so we say, well, I'm sorry, it's nothing personal, it's just our business policy. And we use those policies to keep ourselves from being really in the messiness of people's lives. Uh, we, we have a lot of homeless, that are mostly homeless alcoholics, who work with us, that's our employees, to the mo for the most extent. And when you get involved in the lives of homeless alcoholics, your life gets pretty messed up too. And so we've had to deal with that, right? I've had cars impounded that they were, you know, all kinds of crazy things that have happened dealing with these people that are my friends and are really part of our family. And so your life gets messy. You get wounded. But there's blessings that come from that as well. If I had policies about employee behavior, none of them would work for me after a week. But I don't have those kind of policies. The Pope has spoken about we, did, we can't go just based on meritocracy. Even the poorest of the poor need acorns. And so how do we help them? And, and structuring a business in such a way that you don't just have merit-based achievement, you, you help them anyway, uh, it's a different way of doing business altogether. And so that, um, the, the wounds are worth it because of the blessings. And I think the more that we remember that as EOC entrepreneurs, the better. So those are two things for me. Um, you know the quote from Pope Francis about economy and communion, but I'll read it anyway. These are two words that contemporary culture keeps separate and often considers opposites. Two words that you have instead joined, accepting the invitation that Carol Lubick offered you 25 years ago in Brazil, when in the face of the scandal of inequality in the city of Sao Paulo, she asked entrepreneurs to become agents of community. She invited you to be creative, skillful, but not only this, you see the entrepreneur as an agent of community. So that's powerful, I think, for us to have a vision of that we're agents of communion in the world. And we know that even before, Frank, Francis has been very supportive, I think, of EOC. But even before that, um, in Benedict's work on um, Caritas and Veritate and the vocation of a business leader that came from that, speaks very clearly. There's an EOC imprint. There's lots of fingerprints of the EOC on that document. That we enter into communion to make the world better for all. Um, other concepts that, that arise for me when I'm trying to explain the EOC to my students, one is from the Pope again, the culture of, uh, and, and from Bruni, he's talked about this too, a culture of giving instead of a culture of having. And not just wanting to get and get, but being willing to give and that generosity. Uh, Pope Francis has talked about, you say yes to life, an economy that says yes to life instead of no to life. And so how do we, how do, we do that? How do we construct that? Um, and Bringa has talked about the EOC is a way to help correct the wrong distribution of goods. So to help redistribute some of the goods in the way that we practice our business. Uh, so that's a powerful concept too. 
agents of communion we've already discussed. Degmani um, does a great job, I think, of, of expressing three concepts for EOC. Generativity, which is an interesting concept in English. I've never heard that word before in English, but it's a translation from Italian. Reciprocity and gratuity. When I was first attracted to EOC, it was because of gratuity and reciprocity. I read that, I think, on the Wikipedia page. Like, ah, those are great concepts. And they've been very powerful for me in thinking about how I deal with my uh, tenants, because we have a lot of rentals, and how I deal with other, others along the way. But gratuity and reciprocity, there's a grace involved. And that, that reciprocity is, is responded to. I've been in China for the last two weeks, and my tenants are very gracious to me, because they know I'm in China. Because they also know I'm always trying to deal with them as, as quickly as I can, and try to be. So we have a relationship. Uh, people have said, why don't you outsource your management to someone else? I say, well, then why would I do what I do? The reason I, I like the relationships with people, and it's much more messy that way than to outsource it, but that's what I like. And so that's uh, important to have that reciprocity. You can't have that without the relationship, and then you build up grace with them. But also the generativity. It's the idea that EOC is always thinking of new ways. How can we do this in a new and creative way that will, uh, maybe no one's thought of doing it that way because it doesn't make as much profit. We think, well, it might be a win-win situation for everyone. And so we're willing to take risks as entrepreneurs, I think, that other entrepreneurs wouldn't be willing to take because we aren't doing it simply for profit. We're also doing it for relationship. Um, there is a practice of business not just for profit but for a pursuit of the common good. And so you have a sort of mega level that you're thinking of and how you're trying to run your business and it's for the common good, not simply for myself or even for those directly connected to me. And then the last thing I'll say in closing before we have some time for questions is um, from Crivelli, uh, he's talking about poverty and that we, oh, we're trying to eliminate poverty through economy and communion, certainly by the financial poverty, um, but he's also talked about that we participate in poverty and there's this choice that we make to be poor. We may not be destitute poor, but we are choosing to not have as much profit. But we're choosing to use that profit for something else than a boat or a bigger home or whatever else we might buy with that. So there's a, a chosen poverty that we, then we participate with the poor in that way. Um, and so that, that's that's meaningful, I think, uh, to think about how do I participate with the poor in some way, by giving up some of my profit or in some other way, uh, un being in unity with the poor. By they, I'm not as poor as they are, maybe, but I'm, I'm giving up what I have, some of my riches, in order to connect with that. And then along the lines with poverty too, uh, we are trying to eliminate <coughs> financial poverty, but I think there's other kinds of poverty. I remember a talk by Lorna Gold I watched a few years ago, where she talks about the poverty of community that people face. They're very lonely. And I see that with my alcoholic guys that, I, that we've engaged with. They're very lonely. One of them was living in his truck, Izzy, that worked for me and was a dear, dear friend. But is he was in his truck, and we started meeting with every morning on the porch for coffee. And so then he had something, he had someone. He had other friends than just his alcoholic friends who are, all, who are also very lonely. Alcoholics getting together and drinking, we're all lonely together, that's all. And so he started to have other things that would give him some joy and some hope, because he was part of a community in some way. Um, and he also, there's also a poverty, I think, of vocation. People don't know what they're doing, like what am I here for? And so you have to give them a job to do. People do want to work, as we've heard today. And so to give them work to do is part of what they are, they're meant by God to do, is to have work in the world, to be creative like God's created. And so to give them that vocation, it, it helps solve that poverty of vocation that they have. Um, and then that helps solve a, a maybe a more serious question, just an existential poverty. Like, in general, what am I here for in the world? Not just my job, but why am I here on earth at all? And you start to give them community, you start to give them work to do, they start to have a place in the world. My guys, when they go in, you know, before they were homeless guys, what are you doing in the hardware store? Well, I'm here because I'm getting a toilet green gasket for Gustafson. I work for Oh, you work for Gustafson, okay. What's the number? You know, so we, they have a place in society, now they have a purpose, they're also making money to solve some of their other problems. And then lastly, we would hope, and the, the goal, ultimate goal is spiritual poverty. We're helping to solve that as well, not just financial. But spiritual, and somehow they have a sense from this. Maybe there is a purpose in the world. Maybe there is a meaning that I'm part of. You know, there is some plan, provenance, as EOC and folklore are always talking about provenance. And so how they can start to see providence in their lives, maybe, and start to have faith. So those are things that are powerful to me as we run our EOC business, but also as I 
uh, try to encourage my students to think about business in a different way as well. Um, but now I would just like us maybe to take time. If you have any thoughts or questions you'd like to ask any of the panelists, we can take time to do that, and we'll go from there. And I'll, I'm supposed to keep this closer to hand. Any thoughts or questions? Sure. Yeah. Oh, maybe I should give this to you first. I don't know what we're supposed to do with it. The recording. Thanks for the opportunity. I haven't read all the Ita Italian economists, and uh, so my my question is basically. Oh, just at the front. Oh, come up here. Sorry. Yeah, then you can be on camera. Let's do that. <laughs> Funny because uh, my question was about apprehension. So. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my question is basically, what is our apprehension towards objective measures or standards for bettering the world? I'll, I'll ask that question again, but let me preface it this time. So uh, I was actually more inspired uh, during, during uh, your presentation, Celeste, of um, kind of these different movements <coughs> in business, but, um, but certainly during, during, I mean, everything. One of the words that comes to mind in listening to everything is, is transcendence. So in every sphere we can look at uh, the economy of communion in a different way. Talking about theology, we can look at things in a, we can use the Trinity as a model uh, to understand our relationship within the company, outside the company, these processes of, of doing business and, and transforming the company itself in any way, etc. Uh, so, when we're talking about communion and these different movements uh, for, that are trying to better, better the planet, why don't we try to borrow the value that they've added, or at least recognize it and understand you know, uh, more specifically what it is that they're getting at? Um, so, concretely with B Labs, for instance, I think that would be. It's basically like, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is what you need to do to objectively measure how you're betting the world. Is there a way that we could do that? Uh, be in communion with them more, uh, either by saying, no, we're not going to do that. This is why. You know? Or, or take those best practices. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, the point you made there is, it's very well taken and especially given the way I made the presentation today. Um, trying to keep it to 10 minutes, I chose to prioritize the distinctives and what I think it makes them different. But I think there is a lot that is really good in those movements, and I actually think in each of those cases there is something very important that is shared. I chose not to elaborate on the, that which is shared, um, just for the sake of time, but you're exactly right. I mean, bringing the rigorous financial metrics of business to um, mission-driven firms and charities, and that's, that's incredibly valuable. And, um, and I think that EOC businesses have something to learn from those areas. Good morning, and thanks to all of you. Um, my question is this. Um, you have an opportunity to present the uh, concepts and ideas around the economy of communion in classrooms to young people. What are the arguments or challenges that young people might present to you to say, well, that won't work, or well, how, how can that work, when we see all of the goodness that can possibly come from it, yet why wouldn't they want to go there? And I, I think EOC is really a wonderful vehicle by which we can reach young people. But why would they challenge that? Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Kevin, for your question. Um, but my first thought in terms of trying to frame a response to that is, I can't say that I have a lot of opportunity to really present this in a classroom and really talk about it in depth with uh, my students. Uh, just because of the particular course load that I'm that I need to teach, 
but, um, but I will say that I don't know that I've ever had the experience of a student saying, this won't work, or um, this is not a, not a good thing. Um, my experience has been that students are very current students, and so I guess we're talking 18 to 22 year olds, um, are very interested in alternatives. They're very uh, concerned about um, the way, well, they're very concerned about adulting, uh, which is a new word that I'm learning. <laughs> Um, but they, they're very concerned about the systems, uh, the, the world and the way it works and their place in it and uh, what sorts of things are they going to be asked to do that they, they might not want to do. So, um, so there's a, I think there's a lot of interest. Um, at the same time, it's, um, and I made this comment to John Okama uh, a while back, in many ways, the EOC can be mysterious, and I think it's it's just a challenge for us to <coughs> find the language and the vocabulary and the analogies and the examples that we can use to um, uh, encourage young people to to explore it further on their own, or uh, at the same time without selling something that's different from what it really is. And that's a real challenge. I, that's a, a real challenge for us. I think. So I don't know if that helps. I want to say one more thing. Okay. I think sometimes they wonder. Like I'll explain what I do at EOC, the and then they'll I'll say, "So do you think what I do is a business?" I'll be like, "I'm not sure," because it seems like it's a lot of social work with the homeless guy. And they're like, "No, it's kind of confusing. I'm not sure if it's business." Because they think business is for profit, and what I'm doing is seems more like social work that's benefit. I had a missionary friend of mine one time who said, yours is the only non-profit, for-profit I've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a confusing concept, I think, the EOC message. And I think for a lot of our students, they're going into the corporate world, and they think, well, great, if you own your own business, then you can have Mundell and Associates. Fantastic. But if you're working in, for IBM, or you're working for whoever, ConAgra, well, what, how am I going to use, how am I going to bring these kind of principles into a profit-centered workplace? So I think that's where you have, you know, if you own your own business, it's one thing, and it's helpful to know stories from John, from Paul, along those lines, but then there's people like Nick, who I think have been in larger corporate settings, and then the way that they've responded, the way they've argued with their board to make certain decisions, and if you see those kind of cases, that can help students to start to, they can get some traction there. They can say, okay, maybe this can actually happen in the real world, not just when I'm the sole entrepreneur, <coughs> the owner of this, this company. So that's a challenge, I think. I don't have a question right now, other than the fact that uh, probably one of the more exciting things that, uh, that I was honored to take part in related to this question that was just asked, that Nick and I were invited to on uh, two years in a row, or maybe three years, to come to university here in San Antonio and give a workshop to economic majors on the EOC. And I will have to say that it was very well attended. And unless Nick is privy to this, I we got nothing but enthusiastic um, uh, responses from the students that heard about, uh, that heard this presentation. And maybe Nick, you have some. I think you have a question anyway, but you, maybe you could uh, to add to that. Uh, but it was really a privilege to work with you. I was not planning to respond to you, but uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to go back to what Tom says because I think that uh, the partnership between um, EOC practitioners and academia can be fruitful, and that we need your help in measuring the intangible. Mm -hmm. Because it's easy in some business models saying, we're going to save the world by increasing vaccinations by X percent, then that's our impact. But how do you measure the impact of the USC business beyond the profit, but the societal impact in the community? And we tell great stories that are very impactful, you know, the experiences we have, and they draw people to this, it's happened to you, and you're already living in the problem, and better than we did, so. Um, but we're missing, I think we're missing that for many people to, 
uh, grasp the benefits of living this lifestyle beyond the sharing of profits, um, then intangible, we have a hard time expressing it. Is that a by the way, is that a fair challenge? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just reminded that in charity and truth, Benedict <clears throat> suggests that there there should be alternative paradigms of economics of the free economy. So I would say you know the economic communion is not the way; it is a way. So the other alternatives, we should uh, create that oasis uh, together. And the business schools are actively uh, <clears throat> adapting themselves. I know in CUA, <clears throat> Andrew could explain better to talk about adapting courses, new courses, uh, trying to incarnate this, this approach to the uh, free economy, uh, joining the alternatives and the great opportunities that are there. So I'd like to go back also to what Tom said earlier and, and, and your presentation said last night. Um, I think that integrating, I mean, I think this, the spirit is blowing, okay, across the world in which we live, right? And, and it's blowing in the same direction in so many ways. So what, yes, yes, the UFC is prophetic, you know, and, and it's bringing about something that also includes so many elements from so many existing reality, right, from the uh, uh, socially conscious uh, and, and be, uh, and be um, cooperation and so on and so forth, right? So um, I think it is important to, to integrate all that, but also uh, the, uh, that, that concept of a stakeholder versus a shareholder. Um, the stakeholder companies are not actually necessarily driven by profit. They are truly driven by those various elements about uh, the customers, the employees, the, uh, you know, and then also, and also the processes. I mean, there are you know, several uh, levels there. And measuring that, that performance, as, as Nick was saying, is difficult. But um, uh, many corporations are already working on that you know, and finding metrics, finding ways you know, to actually measure their impact across uh, the various stakeholders. And, 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 and I see, I've seen, I mean, I, I work as a, as a leadership consultant, so uh, I've, I've worked with a number of different corporations, and I've seen an evolution, uh, certainly in the past 10 years, in a lot of companies. Uh, it was last year, I think, that uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, CEOs got together to talk about the stakeholder uh, economy and the stakeholder approach. It's a process that, that's happening, I think, and that's happening in, in a global fashion. So, it's important to recognize that EOC is part of that process, now, is, a, is an element in that process, and, and that's also the, the key to being, uh, to, to being heard. Right? Then the other piece uh, about, the youth, about the young people. Every client I work with, they all have the same challenge. How do we um, engage millennials? You know, they all have that same question. And, and I think that uh, definitely the EOC model uh, is something that's exciting for a lot of millennials. Okay? They are uh, on, on, that, on that wavelength. And, and the stakeholder approach to running a company uh, is also something that's really important to, uh, to, to the newer, newer generation. So it seems to me that it's really important to bring those elements together in, in, in an uh, harmonious um, presentation to show how what is profiting about, about EOC, but also what's what's very much in common with uh, with everything that's that's happening, right? And that's just a, a comment. I think with that we need to close. I don't want to keep you from that. Okay. Thank you. Very much.